Hello and welcome to our Musar study group. I am Batya Gage and we're so glad that you have joined us tonight or whenever you join us throughout the week uh, via video on YouTube. Um, we are here in Texas enjoying some relatively cooler weather. Instead of 105, 110, we're enjoying some wonderful 95 degree temperatures. And believe you me, it feels wonderful. So we are very grateful for that. Hopefully you've had a good week and uh, we're so glad that you're here tonight. Uh, this summer, we've been studying a couple of really good books. The first one is Life in the Balance, which uh, looks at the me dote from the perspective of a father and son who are a rabbi and a psychologist. So they kind of give us the, the Torah view and maybe the sec secular view. Normally, uh, Leah Rebold would be joining us later in the class and uh, going over our other book, which is Windows to the Soul. However, she is still in the process of getting settled here in Texas. She just moved from Kentucky to Texas. She is here and we were able to enjoy Shabbat with her last week, but she's still, uh, you know, in that chaos of getting settled. So hopefully she will be with us next week and um, can get back in, in our groove and we welcome her back at that time. Last week, we talked about uh, the me don't of humility from a little bit different perspective. And that was from the perspective of shame and how shame can be a fence for us to keep us from sinning. Um, if we're feeling ashamed that, or uh, and worry that we might be ashamed of what we're about to do, it could perhaps keep us from doing something we don't want to do. Um, this week, we're going to look at shame from the opposite side of the coin. And the flip side of that is shaming others. Now, um, this is a kid of, by our rabbis and sages is established akin to murder. Uh, Atana taught the following in Rav Nachman Bar Yitzhak's presence. If anyone embarrasses his friend in public, it makes his face turn white, which is, is as if he had shed blood. Now, uh, we may not think of embarrassing one another in public. Uh, it was just a joke. I, we were just funning. But this is a serious offense. And that Tana came from uh, Bava Metzia 56b. Now, if you think about the story of Tamar and uh, Yehuda, she was willing to risk execution rather than publicly humiliate Yehuda. Uh, it was better, it says that to throw oneself into a fiery furnace than to publicly embarrass another person. Now, I really had to do some soul searching this week and uh, really felt convicted to look back and think, have I ever done this in fun, in joking, in jest, embarrassed another person in front of others? This is such a grave nature of an offense that it says that it extends beyond this world into the world to come. The Mishnah in Pirkei Avot 3.1 says, even if one has learned Torah and does good, good deeds, if he publicly humiliates another, he has lost his portion in the world to come. I would put a footnote on that without repentance. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. The Talmud recounts an exchange between King David and his tormentors uh, in which it says that it is better for a man to cohabitate with a married woman uh, rather than he should publicly shame his neighbor. So is this saying that uh, publicly shaming one another is even worse than possibly adultery? Um, someone asked King David, what is the death penalty for one who seduces a married woman? And I replied to them, he is executed by strangulation, yet he has a portion in the world to come. But he who publicly puts his neighbor to shame has no portion in the world to come. So it sounds like this is a pretty serious offense that we really need to seriously look at. 
interestingly enough, uh, on a uh, psychological basis, it says that when a person is feeling humiliated or socially ostracized, that that part of the brain that is engaged at that moment with those feelings is experiencing that moment just the same as if it were a physical thing. So emotional abuse to the brain is the same as physical abuse. So apparently that old saying we used to say as kids and teach our kids, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me, is not true and not something we should be teaching because harsh words are just as painful as a physical blow. Um, experiencing this type of shame is one of the most difficult psychological experiences that a person can endure, and people will go to great lengths to avoid feelings of shame. Um, uh, one of the authors states that even victims of domestic women that are victims of domestic abuse would rather have uh, their their significant other physically abuse them rather than emotionally abuse them. Um, and this is hard to believe, but it's true. Uh, research has shown that when children witness the emotional abuse, not the physical abuse, but the emotional abuse of one parent towards another, they are at greatly increased risk for depression, anxiety, and behavior problems and are six times more likely to experience a physical illness in the given year that which this happens. Um, the most uh, damage is done not by physical abuse, but by emotional abuse. Um, this is what does most damage to the person's psyche, much more so than physical abuse. The Talmud tells us that there is a wide range of behaviors that fall under this. So this is not just what you might picture as someone just uh, going off on a tirade against someone and saying what a horrible person they are and calling them names. But this can include other things like reminding a person of who they used to be or sins they did in the past or their past life. Um, even showing interest, going into a, a, an establishment, showing interest in an item as if we were really going to buy it when we had no intention of purchasing it, this can fall under this same thing. So it, there's a wide range of behaviors that can fall under this um, emotional abuse or shaming one another in public. Um, and the damage that is done with verbal abuse cannot be undone. It's, it's just there. It's stuck in the psyche forever. Um, Rabbi Ravina Yona makes the following point. One who embarrasses others has no portion in the world to come. Why is this? Why, do they, why is this so bad that they have no portion in the world to come? The fact that we don't say this about an actual murderer is because one who publicly embarrasses his friend is probably not aware of the gravity of his offense and therefore is not as likely to repent as one who commits a murder and knows he's done wrong. And he's more likely to repent than the one who has embarrassed someone. He may not be likely to repent at all. Um, we have a story in our book about a, a woman who, uh, when she was in high school, she was emotionally abused by some of the mean girls in, in school. And she kept a diary of those hurtful feelings and she never got over those. So when she went to the class reunion, she took that diary and she confronted some of those people that had been so mean to her and she went on to describe how it had left scars on her throughout her whole life and had impacted how she dealt with life and how she went through other experiences but the former bully so to speak wasn't even aware didn't even remember that these things had happened so often the one publicly shaming someone else 
is not really even aware that they're doing anything wrong. We're often ignorant of the horrific impact that shaming others can have on them. The Shulkana Rook, uh, the Kitsur Shulkana Rook says, one who is uncertain of whether he has sinned needs to repent more than the one who is certain. And this is because remorse comes more easily to one who knows that he has sinned than to one who is unaware. This is why the offering brought by an individual who is not certain he has sinned is more costly than the offering brought by one who knows that he has sinned. So again, I was feeling very convicted this week to do a lot of soul searching, looking back, repentance of things maybe I had done, maybe I didn't remember, maybe I had forgotten. And perhaps this is a time of the year for you to do something similar to, uh, you know, to think back and is this an area where I have fallen short in? So we talked earlier about how publicly shaming another person is similar to murder. And we're gonna look at that in a little more depth. Um, our rabbis make a distinction between red shame and white shame. And what does this really mean? Uh, this is illustrated by the Tana, and this is again in Bava Metza 58b. A Tana recited before Rav Nachman Bar Yitzach, he who publicly shames his fellow is as though he had shed blood. Whereupon he remarked to him, you say well, because I have seen the red coloring of the embarrassed person depart and give way to white. So what is this red and this white? What are they talking about? Well, what they say is that when a person is first confronted with being the victim, so to speak, uh, being publicly humiliated, first they're angry and their face will turn red. And they are in a position to fight back, to get out of the situation, to get out of this humiliating situation. But when they realize that, that there's no way out, um, their face, the color begins to drain from their face and they turn a, an unnatural pallor, which is very much like one who has died. They have no color in their face. The Bhattanura explains the shift from red to white is a two-tiered process. The initial reaction, like we said, is anger. And then um, it gives way to uh, the blood draining from the face uh, as they worry about the anxiety and worry over these feelings of humiliation. This uh, Talmud describes it as going from red to white is where one moves from being angry to full on humiliation. Um, this is marked by anger at first, trying to fight off the feelings of being made to feel small and humiliated to a, a kind of a mini death of feeling paralyzed by shame um, that is associated with exposure and powerlessness. And if you've been on the humiliating side of this encounter, you probably know exactly how they're feeling. Last week, we talked about when you're just so humiliated, you want to just, you want the earth to open up and swallow you. You want to just disappear. Um, and that's how these people are feeling. It says, so how do we know if shame or guilt is constructive or negative. And they give us a number of scenarios or a number of ways to look at this. Um, and it says a key indicator of whether shame or guilt is constructive is to look at the difference in what the inner voice is saying to the person. They give us the example of perhaps someone who, uh, who has been mugged. Uh, there's three ways to look at that. One is you blame the mugger. It was entirely the mugger's fault. He did wrong. He was, and I had nothing, no part in it. The second way to look at it is that the mugger was wrong, but maybe I was wrong. Maybe I was in a place where I didn't need to be. I was alone at night. Um, but, so maybe there's a part of this that I had to do. Or the other way to look at it is it was totally my fault. 
Um, I, I was totally, you know, I brought this on myself. So let's look at these three ways. Counterintuitively, believe it or not, the one who, who blamed the mugger completely without taking any part of it him or herself has a more time psychologically recovering from this assault. You would think that would not be the truth. But psychologically, that is because now that puts you or the person in in the place of being just a helpless victim. There was nothing I could do to avoid this. Uh, you know, I was just helpless. I was powerless. And that makes it harder for the victim to recover from this. Those who engaged in self-blame viewed the incident something that was in part their fault. Maybe I shouldn't have been walking at home alone at three in the morning. Um, they did better over the long run because they removed themselves from the role of being a passive victim. And they learned from this experience. They said, okay, next time I'm going to do this different. I'm not going to be out that late at night. I'm not going to be alone in this area. Um, and so they felt like they had some power in this situation. Um, now, those who engaged in complete self-blame, you know, it was all my fault. These were the ones that had the hardest recovery from this experience. Um, you know, they may be telling themselves, I'm just a loser. These things always happen to me. I'm just, you know, I bring this on myself. So uh, how we respond to these humiliating situations can... Uh, depend how our recovery is depends on what we say to ourselves. Okay, so let's look at humility some more. Um, this whole chapter really is about humility. The Orchut Zadakim describes shame, like we said last week, as a pathway to humility. Shame is the engine that drives an individual's ability to be humble when he's dealing with others. Now, Micah, in Micah 6, 8, he says, uh, what are three fundamentals of the Jewish religion? You could probably quote this verse, to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. So a sense of humility is clearly fostered when we contemplate our helplessness and insignificance in relating in relation to Hashem's omnipotence and greatness. Uh, comparing our smallness to his greatness will certainly bring on a uh, <clears throat> characteristic of humility. Rod Levitas of Yavne said uh, in Ethics of the Father, Pirkei Vote 4.4, <clears throat> be exceedingly humble for the anticipated end of mortal man is that he will turn to worms. So when we remember our lowly origins and our lowly ultimate destiny, we can have nothing but humility, especially when we contrast that to the greatness of Hashem. Feelings of humility will be the natural result from that. Now, interestingly enough, on the psychological, maybe secular side, um, being exposed to nature, uh, a great forest, a, a great mountain, a, a, a vast ocean, these can also give us a feeling of humility. And it's kind of the same concept that we are feeling uh, a smallness in, uh, in relation to this great feats of nature. And perhaps this is why Moshe was called the most humblest person on earth he was the person probably most closest to Hashem and the closer he got to Hashem the smaller and insignificant he saw himself and this brought him to be called the most humblest person on earth um <clears throat> Another way that we can achieve, if you will, humility, is when we compare ourselves, even if we're skilled, if we're a skilled pianist, but then we meet someone 
who is a world renowned concert pianist, our, our feelings of humility will grow in comparison to their great skill. So same way with an athlete that may think they're a great runner, but compared to an Olympic gold medalist runner, uh, their, their feelings of humility are gonna grow because in relation to that, they are really nothing. Um, the phrase meod meod, which means a lot of, exceedingly great, um, is how the, the description of how our relationship to humility should be. Um, and, and this is a phrase that's also reserved for emotions such as uh, anger that are extremely difficult to control. Maimonides describes the need to control any tendency toward arrogance in this manner. He says in Rumbum Hilkot de Deo 2-3, there are some traits that one should not deal with by a middle path. Now, you know, in Musar, we're always talking about the middle path, the balance between um, a, having an extreme amount of a mido or having none. But he said there are some traits in which the middle path is not good enough. And one of those is pride. You can never have a balanced amount of pride. He said, it is a not enough to only be humble. One must be exceedingly humble. There should be no pride at all. However, humility is not synonymous with self-degradation. Uh, we're not just to beat ourselves up and flog ourselves with a, a cat and nine tails, but it must be seen through the prism of the dignity of a human being. Um, the Talmud tells us in Sanhedrin 37a, if a man strikes many coins from one mold, they all resemble one another. However, the supreme king of kings, the holy one, blessed is he, fashioned every man in the stamp of the first man, yet not one of them resembles the other. Therefore, every single person is obliged to say, the world was created for my sake. Interesting statement. Um, yes, all coins, if, if you're talking about money coins, uh, and you compare many of them, they will all look pretty much the same. But Hashem, even though he minted, so to speak, many people from one mold, everyone is different. So the world was created for every one of the uniqueness of us. Rav Simcha Bunim of the Peshika suggested that everybody, and you may have heard this, needs two pockets. In one pocket, it should say, the world was created for my sake. In the other pocket should be a piece of paper that says, I am but dust and ashes. So the goal then is into achieving and knowing when to put your hand into the right pocket or when to put your hand into the left pocket and pull out those statements. You know, our, our rabbis though, warn us of the danger of an unbalanced humility. Now, humility is one of those traits that we need to have in balance. And we have studied this story before, but it, it's just covered in very brief form in our book. And that's the story of Kamsa and Bar Kamsa. And this was at the time of the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash. The Talmud relates that there was a debate regarding what to do with Bar Kamsa. He was about to inform to the Romans on uh, some of the Jews' so-called rebelliousness. Uh, so they proposed to kill Bar Kamsa so that he could not go and inform on them. But Rabbi Zechariah ben Apakula said to them, is one who makes a blemish on consecrated animals to be put to death? Rabbi Yochanan thereby remarked, through the humility of Rab Zechariah bin Apkulas, our house has been destroyed, our temple burnt, and we ourselves have been exiled from our land. Now, when we studied this story in detail before from a previous study, it taught us that uh, this leader, uh, was too humble 
he was like, who am I to put this person to death? And it, it said that a leader needs to have a balanced humility so that he knows when to step up and lead and when not to. And in this particular case, this leader did not have the courage to do what he needed to do. And as a result, uh, great destruction happened, including the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash. So that teaches us that the need for humility must be tempered by, by being able to take bold action when necessary. While we must be exceedingly mayod mayod humble, we must temper this with enough healthy self-respect um, that we can step up and do the right thing when called upon. So um, now we turn to humility from a psychological perspective. It says that humility is a positive personality trait that includes the following characteristics. A non-defensive willingness to see ourselves accurately. Um, we're not seeing ourselves as too bad or too good. We can see ourselves accurately. An ability to assimilate information in a manner that is not distorted. So we can hear something and we don't have to um, measure this information against our own, what we think is right and true, but we can hear it for what it is. Absence of a self, sense of self-importance needing to put ourselves out as the most important person in a group or a situation. No need or interest in dominating others. The ability to acknowledge one's own mistakes and imperfections. Keeping one's abilities and accomplishments in perspective, like we spoke about earlier. You may be a great musician, but compared to a world-renowned musician, uh, being able to keep your skills and achievements in perspective. And a relatively low focus on self. So you are not necessarily the center of your own universe. Everything doesn't resolve, revolve around you, but you are just one of many. And appreciation of the value of all things, what other people can contribute, what you can learn from others. Uh, giving others the credit for certain for certain successes instead of trying to grab it all yourself. Um, now it contrasts hum humble people with their opposite, which would be what they say is narcissistic people. So what? How is a narcissistic person characterized? They believe that they are always better than everyone else. If there is a failure, it was someone else's fault. They are very competitive and always seeking to outperform everybody else. They must be the best. They believe that they, above everyone else, deserve special treatment. Um, we see some of this maybe in traffic when everybody's trying to get to their destination, but there's one or more drivers that feel like everyone should just pull to the side and let them go through special treatment and tendency to lash out at others who don't necessarily agree with them. How dare you disagree with me? Preoccupied with their own rights and they can become aggressive when their sense of superiority is questioned. How, who are you? How dare you think that I am not the best, the greatest of all time? So what are the benefits psychologically to just being a humble person? Um, well, they get along better in a group, obviously. They work better with others. They are less likely to engage in risky behavior, this very competitive behavior that says, I must be better than everyone else. Um, they're more inclined to be forgiving of others and to let go of their anger without bearing grudges. And they are are often viewed by others as just more positive people. So how can we foster uh, this sense of humility within our own homes? It says that when children feel guilty about something they've done wrong, 
don't be too quick to reassure them and say, ah, oh, it was okay, it's okay. But if, instead, help them to engage in an active teshuva and perhaps teach them how to make amends for this action of theirs. Um, number two is to cultivate an attitude of non-defensiveness when things go wrong and to learn, teach, uh, teach ourselves and our children to learn from mistakes. Uh, don't beat them up about it. Uh, don't make them feel awful, but teach them to learn. Number three is to develop an attitude of openness to learn from everyone. Um, one of the sayings is that a wise person is one who learns from everyone he encounters. And humility is partly defined by that, by learning from everybody. So everyone that comes along, uh, we can learn something from them. And teaching our children the same thing. And it says number four, families that fail to foster a sense of appropriate humility will uh, struggle and they'll um, have the following characteristics. Placement of an extreme emphasis on performance. So in a family where humility is not taught, performance is everything, popularity, grades, perfectionism, reliance on excessive praise or excessive criticism. Everything you do, uh, as a child of that family, you're either seeking praise or the parent is dishing out ex excessive criticism. And a tendency to make frequent comparisons to peers or siblings in the family. Why aren't you like your brother? Why can't you make the grades? Why aren't you as good at sports? Um, and overt or covert communication to a child conveyed to him that he is either better than everyone else or worse than everyone else. So these would be the characteristics of a family in which humility is not fostered. So in a family where uh, they have been raised with a healthy sense of humility, what does that look like? A parenting style that strikes a proper balance between love and limits. Um, love is not just letting them do whatever they want to or providing such harsh limits that they cannot achieve them. Parents who provide realistic feedback um, to their children, appropriate praise when necessary, calmly pointing out to the child when they've done something wrong and how they can improve. Uh, another characteristic is parents who model humility in their own dealings. Okay, well, that's our lesson on humility from the perspective of shame. Shame is a good constructive fence, and shame is something we are to avoid uh, in doing and in dishing out on others. Um, I'm going to, if you want to open up your uh, microphones, if anyone has anything to add, I'd uh, be glad to hear it. I see what y'all said. I, know, I saw some pretty good comments coming by on chat. It uh, says when you've been uh, publicly shamed, it's as if a part of your life is being pulled out. Um, so uh, again, we may have been on both sides of this. Um, we may have been the one dishing out the shame. Maybe we didn't mean to embarrass someone. Hopefully we've never been one of the mean girls, but maybe we were just having fun at someone's expense. Um, and everybody's laughing and you're thinking, oh, this is pretty, everybody's laughing at me because I'm making fun of this person. You didn't mean anything, but we need to be aware of that. And again, on the other side of the fence, uh, we need to be aware of our emotions when we're in such a situation and realize that it starts off with anger and it, and it ends in humiliation. And that uh, of the three ways to kind of experience this, the one where I'm partly to blame and I'm partly not uh, is probably the best path. 
Um, what can I learn from this that would make it different next time, rather than I'm all to blame or I'm none to blame? Okay, anybody else before we, uh, oh, we got a hand raised, show me where I'm at. This is amazing because this is one of the things that is apparent in the tour portion this week about humility and uh, not publicly shaming people. Mm -hmm. Because one of the things that uh, made Yehoshua being noon the choice to uh, succeed Moshe Rabbeinu was the fact of his humility. And this is going all the way back to the Torah portion known as Behalotka, where we had to get a brand new set of elders. And there were two individuals named Eldad and Medad who were basically yes. prophesying outside yes. the camp and they were saying so many things and one of the things they were saying is that Yehoshua was going to lead the children of Israel into the promised land and that Moshe Rabbeinu would die now okay. if you think about what that means that the the conquering of the kingdoms the establishing of the Beit HaMikdash you know being a light to the nations and all that was going to happen under Yehoshua AKA Yeshua. Mm -hmm. The thing about this is how many times would we be tempted to hear something when we hear something told good about us, like what our destiny would be, or like, hey, I want you to know this is how great things are going to be for you in the in the future. When something is told about us, like what wouldn't it be that immediate urge to be like, oh yeah, that's amazing. That's awesome. I'm okay with that. You know, yeah. but yeah. at the expense of someone dying and you've been talking about shame this whole time. Yeah. And then Yehoshua was known as Moshe Rabbeinu's prime Talmud, his prime disciple. Mm -hmm. So what actually caused Yehoshua to be the one best suited for the job, for lack of better terms, was because of his humility and the fact that he said, you know what needs to happen to these two individuals? They need to be put in jail. They need to be put in timeout because they don't need to be saying these things about our great leader, Moshe Rabbeinu. This oh, is not the time for me to be uh, uprooting the leader and taking over. Because you think about how many takeover, quote unquote, tried to happen since that right. Torah portion. Right. And Yehoshua was the first one to be like, we're not doing this. What Hashem has set and what Hashem has established, that's the protocol. That's the structure. And when Moshe Rabbeinu was called the humblest man in the Torah, the Or Lachaim, not to be confused with the Or Hachaim, brings this down saying that the letter Yod was taken out of the word Anav, which is the Hebrew word for humility. Moshe Rabbeinu took that letter out because he felt like he was not humble. And the Torah says that he was. And that letter Yod that was taken out was actually the Yod that was added to Yehoshua's name oh, wow. by Moshe. So Moshe was like, the humility that I lack is actually found in Yehoshua. Wow. Wow. So it was just kind of like this really uh, neat thing when you think about humility. Number one, it's a person who wants to preserve life. It's a person who doesn't want to excel at the detriment of other people. They don't want anyone publicly disgraced because you have to think about the level that Moshe reached. You know, he took us out of Mitzrayim. How many people could even do that? Right. And it was public knowledge that, oh, yeah, he's going to die. I don't know what he did, but he's going to do something so horrible that he's going to die. And Yehoshua was like, we're not going to talk like that. Wow. So anyway, I just I just think about that when you uh, talked tonight and in the ways that we could work on ourselves is we don't want other people's detriment. No. So. Very good. Very good preview into our tour portion this week. Anyone else? OK, well. I thank you all for joining us tonight, uh, next week, same time, same channel. And uh, very likely Leah Rabot will be back with us a little more settled and be able to uh, 
pick up with our Windows to the Soul book and get us back on track with that. It's a book that covers the uh, tour portion a little more closely than our general meat of the life and the ballots. So I thank you for uh, joining us and um, we'll hope to see you next week and have a great Shabbat coming up. Thank you and good night.